I remember singing that song many, many times and sang it prayerfully. Lord, lift me up and let me stand on heaven's table land. A higher plane I cannot find. Is there any higher place to stand in life than standing with God? What a, what a great place to plant your feet. If you have your Bibles there with you this morning, turn with me, please, to the second book of Timothy, the very first chapter. Second Timothy, the very first chapter. We'd like to read 12 verses, but I'm going to read 6 through 8 because of the time factor. First, 2 Timothy 1, starting with the 6th verse. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou wouldst stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. For a few moments this morning, I want to talk to you about when God strikes the match. Let's pray before we get into it. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you this morning for your word that's open before us. God, we thank you for the message that's contained within those words that is so important for us to understand and to hear and allow it to get a hold of us this morning. Not just for our own benefit, God, but for the benefit of our families, the benefit of our church, and God, the benefit of the world of which we reside in. I pray, Father, let your word come off the page. Let your servant be anointed. And we pray, God, that you are just going to have your wonderful way in everything that is said and done this morning here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When God strikes the match, I, I want to talk to you this morning about passion. When you look up the definition of passion... This is what, at least some of what you will find. A strong feeling of enthusiasm or excitement for something or about doing something. I remember with absolute clarity the day when God saved my soul and when I left the church after that service saved and forgiven and cleansed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't know the words of the song at that point in time, but if I did have what it sang, them, I remember when my burdens rolled away. What a weight was lifted from my shoulders. What excitement filled my heart and life. I did not wait for a day. I did not wait for a week. I did not wait for a month. Uh, to be able to begin to uh, expound or explain or, or uh, verbalize uh, what God had placed in my heart because when I came through the back doors of my home, my mom and dad and sister were there, and the first thing that blurted out of my mouth, I got saved. I got saved. I couldn't wait to get back to church. I wasn't saved all that long before I begin to visit the pastor and ask him, is there something I can do? Could I teach a class? I want to get involved. I want to jump in with both feet. And, and what began to happen at the very 
start of my experience of the Lord has continued to grow, and it has never ceased to grow all these years. Now, here's the sad note. Because the enthusiasm and excitement that I'm talking about, every one of us have known at some point in time in other areas of your life. Now, I can't speak as much to women as I can to men, but I remember as a kid when I joined a baseball team and the excitement and the enthusiasm of going to the practices and playing the games and, and hearing the coach call you off the bench to, uh, to bat or to play for your first game. I remember later on when I began to uh, lift weights as a teenager. Of course, I thought I was going to be one of these gigantic muscle-bound guys and I bought the weights and I bought the magazines and I bought the books and I bought the protein supplements. They were the most horrible tasting things you could imagine. But I thought if, if I take them and I end up with a 20-inch arm, boy, thank God that didn't happen. I, I found out that's kind of freakish later on. Um, uh, but I, it was, I was all in, all in. And then I begin to train in karate. Listen, you, you should have lived in my neighborhood because, you know, TV was three stations back in those days, but they didn't have to worry about TV because I was playing on a show over in my yard every day. I built all this equipment in my yard. I had heavy bags hanging. I had a chuck spring in the ground with a pole padded up that you could hit and it bounced back and come back and try to hit you back. I had a rubber ball hanging off my mom's clothesline that I used that as a training tool. I had built a, a mucky war of man that looked like a guy out there all padded up that I'd beat on. It could be two foot of snow in the ground and they could look out and what is that nutty Jones kid doing now? I'm out there working out with a winter coat on in the snow. I was excited. And you know what, when I got saved, it hit me very quickly that I could not in any way, shape, or form show less enthusiasm and excitement toward the things of God than I did for the things of this world. Matter of fact, I was determined to weigh out distance my enthusiasm in the worldly things as I pursued God with everything I had within me. And every pastor we went, Karen and I would roll up our sleeves. We would after work, because the first seven years of our ministry, we worked jobs on the side. We'd be on the streets handing out tracts. We'd be going door to door. We would be at the church for every uh, single activity you could imagine. We just could not involve ourselves enough visiting the shut-in, preaching in the nursing homes. Man, when I was in Saginaw, those nursing homes loved me so much. I'd preach at one, another one called me. I'd preach at that one, another one. I was preaching at three and four nursing homes a month. I was preaching at the jail once a month. I was preaching at the rescue mission once a month. And you know what? It was exciting. I, 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 I can't tell you because of what God had done in my life, what a privilege it was to represent him and to be about the master's business. Well, Paul is addressing this here. And I like the phrase because he's wanting to remind Timothy. I think this morning we need a bit of a reminder of where we used to be and where we are this morning. Of what we used to do and what maybe we're not doing this morning. I think to be, we need to be reminded of the work that God has done in us. And there's an expectation on God's part for us to return something of what he has placed within our heart and life. So Paul reminds Timothy to do what? He says, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. Who was to stir that gift? Was the pastor to come running down and, and grab a hold of you and, and stir you and shake you? No, you were to stir yourself. It's not my job to stir you, although I try. It's your own job to stir yourself. Sometimes you have to grab yourself by the nap of the neck and pull yourself out of the seat. Sometimes you got to look in the mirror and, and take a good, hard look at yourself and be honest with yourself that you're not the man or the woman of God that God has intended you to be. And there needs to be some changes. There needs to be some alterations. There needs to be some adjustments uh, in your heart and life. Someone once said, there are many things in life that will catch your eye, but only a few will catch 
your heart. Purpose those things that grip your heart. For example, consider what a great golfer said in a magazine article recently. He said, don't mistake my ability to focus for misery. I'm having a great time on the course. But he describes his concentration as really intense. The book Lessons from the Top says, no trait is more noticeable in the leaders on our list than the passion they share for their people and their companies. Quite simply, they love what they do. This morning when the alarm went off to get up and to get ready for church, did your husband or wife have to keep poking you in the ribs and say, come on, get up. It's time to go to church. Oh, I don't know if I want to go today. Isn't there, wait a minute, didn't Pastor Jones say, there's a YouTube if we don't go? Honey, think about it. We'll leave our bathrobes on, get a nice hot cup of coffee. Uh, let's get a bear call maybe too and we'll share it as we sit on the couch and, and, and watch uh, that uh, service this morning. Um, watch Pastor Jones get all excited behind the pulpit and, and, and we'll just kind of shake with a little excitement ourselves for just a moment. But don't spill your coffee. I preached a funeral on Friday. I was talking to Craig at Osborne's the funeral director, and he, of course, interacts with a lot of pastors. And he said the problem, he said, with everybody that's coming through the doors right now, the preachers, is that X amount of people now have gotten uh, taken into the YouTubes or the streaming of some sort and are using it. Not, not the shut-ins. Now, we're not talking about people that can't make it. We're talking about people that can, but they're not because it's very convenient just to sit home and watch a, you know, a 35 or 40 minute YouTube and call it church. Listen, what kind of enthusiasm is that? What kind of excitement is that? A world is going to hell and we can't amount any more excitement than that than to watch a 35 or 40 minute YouTube and call it a day when it comes to church. Listen, I've said it for a long time and whether anybody at the top ever listens to me in our own organization, they talk about the great days we're in. What great days are we in when we are eliminating Sunday night, eliminating Sunday school, eliminating Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries, and we say we're doing great things? I'm saying we're moving in the wrong direction. Once again, the enthusiasm that used to grip our hearts, an old-fashioned outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in our churches needs to happen again, or we're in trouble. We're in trouble. These people loved what they do. I love doing the things of God. I hope you love doing the things of God. I would not have continued doing what I do if I did not love what I do. When we talk about passion, we aren't talking about a brand of perfume or about the steamy television show or novel. We're talking about a burning drive God places within us. What, what kind of burning drive does God place within us, my friends, to change the world. He gives us a love for him. He gives us a love for his house, a love for his word, a love for the work of God. It consumes us. We're talking about the motivation we feel when we go about his work. I, I remember years ago as a kid, I, I had... Badges coming down the lapel of my little sports coat. Every badge represented a year of never missing Sunday school. So I was there. And I remember one teacher I had, Mrs. Stearns, if I remember the name properly. I was about fourth or fifth grade. There was something about that woman. She, she made the word of God alive. When your children go into their Sunday school class, is their teacher bringing the word of God alive to them? Does, does anybody come so well prepared today that the student kind of moves to the edge of their seat because they're being captivated by what is being talked about? There's been some real study uh, put into it. There's an illustration that not just touches their intellect, but it touches their heart. 
Folks, we, we need that kind of enthusiasm today that would say, that would make a youngster rise up in the morning and say, man, I can't wait to get to Sunday school. An adult that would say, I can't wait to get to church. When passion burns within us, we focus on life more easily and effectively. And in 2 Timothy here, Paul helps us identify four action steps that identify and intensify our passion. The first one is this. Reach up to God. If you're coming here for any other reason than reaching up to God, you're here for the wrong reason. We are not here promoting this preacher or this denomination or this particular building. We are here to live Jesus higher. We are here to shine the light on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And my friends, there's a desperate need for you and I to reach up and to get a hold of God and for God to get a hold of us. You know what I liken it to? Get a hold of a live wire. You ever done the electrical work and, and, and you know, you didn't want to walk out the garage and turn the switch off so you thought I'll just be careful that I don't touch the wires together yeah how did that work out hey you got a hold of a live wire made you jump we need to get a hold of a live wire everybody wants to be connected to something but here's the tragedy too many people today are plugging their lives into dead wall sockets if a man is not preaching the word of God, if the worship doesn't exalt Jesus, if a church is not panting after winning the loss for Christ, we're plugging into a dead socket. I want to plug into something that's alive, that's life-changing, not just my life, but everybody around me. Paul understood that the spiritual life pulsating within him was given to him by God alone. You can't get it out of a book. Somebody cannot give it to you from themselves to you. There has to be a direct encounter with God himself. Paul understood that. Paul understood that was a life pulsating within him. And he wanted Timothy, and he wants you and me to share in what he had. This is one of the things that I love about what God does in a person's life. He doesn't give us something and, and I say to somebody like Brother Decker here, I got it, you don't. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> he wants us so excited in what God has given us to share it with a brother, to share it with a sister, to share it with our children. What a desperate need in this hour to share it with our grandchildren. That somehow, some way, they'll catch the vision. They'll have an, a, an impact of God upon their life. It will do me no good having a genuine experience with the Lord that in several generations later, it's lost in the shuffle. They're not coming to know God. They need to come to know God too, just as we have come to know God. Paul was an apostle sent to the Lord Jesus Christ according to the will of God and according to the promise of life that he had found in Christ Jesus. He had experienced God's grace and experienced God's mercy and experienced God's peace. All those graces were like lumps of coal fueling the passion that was burning in his heart and life. Having experienced these same coals in a service like this this morning, every one of us should be walking out the door on fire for God. Why do you think radical people in the world are able to congregate a crowd about them? Something burns within them. I'm not saying it's the right thing, because it's not in many cases. But because something's burning within them, they attract others. A lot of these people are nuts. How much more you and I need to burn for Jesus and attract those about us to the Lord Jesus. We're not attracting to us. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. We need to leave here on fire for God every time we meet. Secondly, reach inside yourself. 
Helen Keller said, life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing. Did you hear me? It's either a daring adventure or nothing. Timothy had been raised in a Christian home. His mother and grandmother had laid the foundation in his life. I, I, I'd like to jump up onto the mountaintop and scream out to the entire church world. Mom, grandma, dad, grandpa, your children and grandchildren need you to impact them for Christ. These women did such a good job in raising up Timothy. He was prepared to hear the message from the lips of the Apostle Paul. We need more strength of God in our homes this morning, folks, like we've never seen it before. It's being eroded away by the television, by the internet, by the smartphone, the iPad, the computer age, the AI that's now working its way into society. If we don't wedge our way in and begin to make a difference, we're going to lose this generation. We'll not impact them for God like we need to. If we're going to be passionate in life, we must decide to stop being the victim and become the victorious winner. You know, I, I love people, and, and, you know, I'm a pastor, so I deal with all kinds of people. And every so often, I will come on to someone that will actually come to me with a word of encouragement. And when I walk away, I think, wow, where did that come from? That felt good. Because a lot of times what people do, and, and I'm not calling anybody's name out. I hope I'm not talking about you. Maybe. But every time you meet up with them, oh, my goodness, get the violin out because we got a sad story to tell. You think we are the downcast, uh, trod, downtrodden people of the world. We think we got a worse than everybody. Oh, man, life is tough. Hey, would you come to church with me Sunday? Are you kidding? If that was what Jesus did for you, I don't want no part of it. He don't make life worse. He makes it better. He puts a bounce in your step, puts a joy in your heart, puts a smile on your face, makes you a radiant individual, makes you an asset to society. Let's stop playing the loser and the victim. Let's become the winner. Let's become the people that can impact those about us. The world is in desperate need of it. Take somebody under your arm, so to speak, and mentor them and help them and encourage them. You know, there are some children here that would love to have a man figure in their life to point them in the right direction. Or a young lady would like to have a, a godly woman figure in their life to point them in the right direction. You may not be related by blood, but you are related by spirit. And be a spiritual mom and a spiritual dad and show an interest. Listen, one of my high points is when I get done, I go in the lobby and I got these kids coming up to me and they won't leave without giving the preacher a hug. In my mind, I'm thinking, Lord willing, I'm making a little bit of an impact on them. If nothing more, they know somebody by the name of pastor is a man that can love them and care about them and show them uh, the right way to go in the course of life. My friends, this morning, we must trust him with a competent interfaith and his plans for us, Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. When we allow the seeds of God's word to germinate and grow within us, when we walk by daily faith, thereby we have all the resources we need Paul was simply reminding us that in Christ we have the necessary foundation to be what God has called us to be. Now I'm standing here this morning in my 53rd year as a pastor. I could have never survived those years without the calling of God. Because in times it became very bleak and disappointing and desperate. 
battling with people in churches and all kinds of stuff. But I always fell back on the call because that's what God called me to do. So I was able to persevere and continue. But listen, the pastor is not the only one that's called. We're all called to something. You might be called to be a Sunday school teacher, a board member, work in the office, clean up around the church, do some yard work, teach a boy in Rangers, teach a girl in girls' ministries, assist in a Sunday school class, work in the sound booth, work in the projection booth, be an usher. I mean, the jobs are endless. Decorate the church. You know, the church doesn't, I don't just walk in here one Sunday and say, wow, look what the Lord did the last time we came. He took all the decorations down, put all new decorations up. Wow. That don't, that don't, the Lord's not doing that. The Lord is prompting somebody that's got some talent and skill in that area to do it. To go out in the kitchen and after an, an event and mix up some punch and, and, and put some cupcakes out. That's a needed function. A calling, if you would. Every one of us in some fashion and in some way have a calling of God. Are we stepping up and responding to the call? In some ways, I hate this moment in time in which I'm living because I see a church where you can't get Sunday school teachers, you can't get volunteers. I t- the the higher, up, higher up tell me that in our churches, there are men now that are, that are somewhat qualified but even though they're somewhat qualified to be a board member, they refuse to serve as board members today. What is wrong with us? What, what is wrong with us? What has happened? I blame part of it on the pulpit today, but I blame part of it on people in the pews because something has be, there's been a disconnect, and somehow we got to get reconnected again, roll our sleeves up, and get going for God. I was going through some papers this past week, and there was a pastor that wrote me, some years ago, and, and it made mention that when him and his wife walked in here, it, immediately they sensed the presence of God. Let me tell you something. I want that. I want that more than anything. That when people come in here, it's not they're looking for, for three songs and a dance and some flashing lights. I'm wanting them to come in here, and when they walk out here saying, we have been in the presence of the Lord. Father, give us a connect again. Give us an understanding of our calling. And because there is a calling, God gives us, equips us, everything of which we have need of to fulfill that calling. So one day when we stand before God, there will be no excuse. Because God will say, I gave you everything you needed to do what I called you to do, and yet you still did not do it. Number three, reach down to others. Reach down to others. At 6th and 7th verse, Paul urged Timothy to fan the flame, the gift, that had been given to him by God. It was essential that Timothy obeyed because countless numbers of others needed to be touched by his ministry just as he had been touched by Paul's. I was reminiscing a little bit with Brother Tom Trask this past week, our former general superintendent. He took the superintendent's position in Michigan the year I was ordained. And we've had a lot of interaction over the years, including a wonderful invitation to preach down in Springfield a couple of years before I came here to pastor. But we were talking about some of the men that he knew and I knew, and some are in ill health now. Uh, talking about what it used to be like in our churches and the excitement and, and, and the things that were going on. Listen, I look at my own pastor and with with the greatest of respect and so appreciative of what he passed on to me. But you know, here's the reality. My pastor started in the ministry later in life. He retired at 65 to the best of my recollection. So maybe, maybe he pastored for 30 years. In the home church I got saved in, it ran about 100 people. The church he pastored in Jersey after that probably ran about the same. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that because I'm here this morning and was impacted by his ministry and, and we're glad because of it. 
But the reality is, he sowed something into me. I've pastored a number of churches. I have won not just hundreds, but thousands of souls. And it all goes back to his credit for what he deposited in me. And it goes back to his pastor for what he deposited in him. Now, here's my question to you this morning. And what God has deposited in you, as Paul deposited in Timothy, who are you giving it to? Who are you impacting? Who are you touching? Who are you so uh, moved upon that they will now, after your influence in their life, will continue the work of God? You see, it's all dependent on passing on the message from one person to one generation to the next. When a Christian is transformed by Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit, the fire of passion ignites. Paul didn't want Timothy to become discouraged for he believed that because he believed in this young man, and so did God. Now it was time for Timothy to reach down to others and make the message of the gospel come alive. In other words, it was the fruit of Paul's ministry coming full circle. Is now Timothy would step into Paul's shoes and begin to impact lives. And they in turn, as time came and went, they would in turn impact lives. Now some of you here this morning say, well, I'm up in years. Are you still drawing breath? I don't see anybody dead in the pew this morning. Let's keep it that way, please. You got a heartbeat? You still can impact somebody. I mean that. Um, Brother Decker, I'm going to use you as an example. I hope you don't be embarrassed. <laughs> this brother has come to me with, with more than one encouraging words over the years. Unbeknownst to him, sometimes a word spoken in a time of discouragement that cheered my heart. He's made a difference. Unbeknownst to him, maybe, but he made a difference. How many could you make a difference in with just a kind word? Showing somebody a little bit of attention. Even in a church like this, which, you know what, I think this is one of the most wonderful family churches I've ever pastored. Friendly, kind uh, ingratiating, and yet tragically, even in a church like this, somebody can come and go without any encounter with somebody else. That should never happen, but it does. Can I give you one more? Number four, reach out to the world. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. His purpose and passion were to reach the lost and to inspire Timothy to do the same. You know, they talk a, a, about, a, a lot about mentoring. Somebody gets saved, now you've got to take them and you've got to go through all these steps to mentor them. I've got to be honest with you, nobody ever mentored me. My pastor never sent me a letter. He never paid me a personal visit. But he just faithfully went to that pulpit every time we came to church. And God used his ministry to impact my life and to put a fire and a burden in me to win lost souls. Listen to me this morning. Who in the world are we inspiring this morning to go out and to win lost souls? You say, well, I don't know any. Oh, sure you do. Some may be under your own roof. Some might be living next to you and you call them neighbors. Some will be those people you work with in the shop and in the office. Might be the gal at the checkout at the store. Might be somebody you just bump into walking down the road taking some exercise. When are we going to grasp that moment that God grants you and I to speak into somebody the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring them to Christ? Listen, nothing is grander and more glorious than talking to somebody cold turkey and, and they become interested in what you have to say. And before the conversation ends, they're bowing their head with you and giving their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Karen and I started in Marshall, Michigan as associate pastors in a little church that ran about maybe 100 people. But there was a man in that church, John Lambert, 
him and I would go out every week, sometimes twice a week, and we'd walk up and down the streets of Marshall, Michigan, and at that particular time, the streets were loaded with young people. And as we handed tracts out, we would buttonhole somebody and we'd talk to them about the Lord. And I cannot tell you how many times there on those street corners, they bowed their head and gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing more exciting and invigorating, my folks, than that type of an experience. We need to somehow, some way, you and I collectively together, we need to reach this world for God. Passion knows no boundaries when God is leading us. He's put us on a mission. We are appointed as heralds and apostles and teachers and sharers of the gospel, not by the preacher, but by God. And before our life runs out, we need to stand up and count for God before it is too late. Let me conclude with this. To be set on fire, we must let God kindle the blaze. What is your passion this morning? I, I can't answer that for you. you got to answer that for yourself. Are you ready to partner with God and to make a difference in this life? Partnering with God. Fred Sherrill said, Success is not the result of spontaneous combustion. You must set yourself on fire. Now those words are true with one minor change. Success is not the result of spontaneous combustion. You must first allow God to set you on fire. And you know what this morning? God is in the house. And God wants to set us on fire. Life, my friends, is worth living when we reach up, we reach in, we reach down, and we reach out. Life is worth living when we let God strike the match and allow his passion to begin to really burn in you. And I pray it will. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads in your presence this morning, God, it's our cry, our prayer, our plea, oh God, strike the match and set us on fire again for you. Now some may still be burning, but the, but the, the flame is awful low. Some may be at one time been red hot for God, but they're almost lukewarm this morning. But God has stepped into this church this morning with a desire to bring about some fresh enthusiasm and excitement to the things of God. It can't be merely the preacher becoming a spiritual cheerleader. In fact, what it will take and what needs to happen is for God to come alongside of every one of us individually and to begin to set us on fire again for him. A passion once again for fellowship with God. A passion to spend time in the word. A passion for lost souls. A passion for the work of Almighty God. Do you want that kind of passion this morning? Do you want it? God's talking to you, not this preacher. Do you want it? Do you really want to partner with God and make a difference this morning? If you're that person that wants to partner with God and be full of His passion and you want to make a difference, even though maybe some of you here, and thank God for it, are making a difference already, you even want to make a greater difference. God's speaking to you. Is that you? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. See, I don't want no hands. I want you to stand up for Jesus. Here I am, God. Set me on fire.
Fill me with your passion. Let out, let out all the stops. Let nothing stop me. And let my passion rub off on the next person and rub off on that person. Oh God, I'm tired of plugging into a dead socket. Lord, I want to grab that live wire this morning. I want to grab the hands of the Holy Spirit to set me on fire. My God, I pray that passion is going to be birthed within the heart and life of every one of us this morning. No job will be too great. No job will be too small. No individual will be too insignificant. God, you are going to consume us with a desire to build your church, to reach this community, to win lost souls, to salvage our family, and to really, really, really make a difference. As Christine begins to sing, this altar's open. Let's, we're on our feet. Let's find a place around the altar. If you can't kneel, come and stand. And then I'm going to close in a word of prayer.